And, and if people catch this vision that, you know, what we need now is a ruminant revolution, I'm very suspicious of the people who want to come up with some faux food that they think is going to be the solution to whatever problem, well, new wealth generation, uh, ecosystem services. There's a list of things. Again, proper management is key, but properly managed grasslands are best for watershed management, uh, pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat. Um, so I, I think that we, we've covered a number of things that all point to um, toward the same thing, that, that proper nutrition is essential for proper human development, function, and health span. I, I like that phrase versus lifespan, right? Um, and and that anything we do is going to have an environmental impact. It's going to come out somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even to the point where human beings who are primarily fat burners, as opposed to carbohydrate burners, emit less CO2. Let's um, get into it anyway. We'll get into the crux of the uh, crux of it, really. I mean, there's so many things we can talk about today, but um, we'll start with busting a few myths on uh, ruminant animals for a, for a start being bad for the environment. And because this is one of the, the biggest arguments that um, people have against us eating meat. Um, of course, they don't mind that. Of course, it's only cows that are the problem, not every other animal on the planet. So, um, let's mm. talk about that. Let's start with what are the what are the problems with raising cattle? Well, um, depends on which side of that operation you're on, right? It it tends to be a long term kind of business. Right. It's it's many years between when a cow is bred and when that calf then has her calf that then you can sell. I mean, that's several years, um, you know, two years for the calf to give her first calf and then another two years or so before the the grand calf is at market weight. So not a lot of businesses operate well on that kind of long-term thing. So a lot can happen environmentally. Um, the cattle cycle is driven by the water cycle, as someone just recently pointed out. So um, it's very much tied to environmental issues. And that's before we get to the regulatory environments. And then you have all the anti sort of messaging coming as well. Um, you know, the, the biggest cost in a cow calf operation is feed cost yeah. and so a lot of people are doing work to help people lower that by improving their grazing management because anything that the cow harvests is going to be cheaper than anything you can deliver on a truck um, but then we have a problem in the u.s with from the producer to the consumer there are issues in there in terms of availability of slaughterhouses so that you could have sale by cut as opposed to sale by the whole carcass. Um, there's a lot of issues. We began by talking about the people who think that somehow ruminant animal agriculture is inherently bad for the environment, right? And like anything, you can do it poorly or you can do it well and when it's done well we have some really i think good news we have to get better at telling that good news yeah yeah i agree so speaking about the the so the the messaging at the moment being that uh, raising ruminant animals is is bad for the environment somehow what i mean how how are cattle um, or raising cattle affecting the environment specifically? Okay. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that without ruminant animal agriculture, there is no sustainable food systems. 
period. Um, and, and actually all animal agriculture, but in ruminant animals have a particular ecological advantage in that they are supremely adapted to turn plant fiber into products of highest nutritional quality for human consumption. Um, basically, all ruminants consume a diet that's high in fiber, low in fat, low in protein of poor quality. And, and they upcycle that resource into meat and milk and fiber and other um, products as well as ecosystem services. Um, in addition, what happens within that rumen due to microbial degradation produces methane, whether that's in a, um, you know, wild ruminant or a domesticated ruminant. And so some work has taken place that estimates that there are comparable emissions from wildlife dominated savannas or livestock dominated savannas. So we've had these conversations as if there is such a thing as grassland with no methane emissions from the animals that are supported by the grassland. Grassland has to be grazed or burnt in order for it to remain productive. Um, I think we'd rather have it grazed because if we don't, then we also have an increasing fire danger from a buildup of fuel as well as other negative um, developments. Um, in addition, you know, basically m agriculture is the history of humanity modifying its environments to produce more biomass than those environments would produce without those modifications. And so that could be any number of interventions. And we have a long history as a species of using fire, for example, to improve hunting um, or to keep the understories of forests more open so that we could gather nuts more easily or so that there would be more wildlife there for hunting. Um, and then, of course, as we've gone along over the millennia, we've developed different technologies and, and knowledge that those interventions get greater and greater. Today, we can say that the production of animal source food from grasslands through ruminant animal systems is the only agricultural practice that can share the ecosystem. All the others have to dominate it. Right? If we're going to plant a crop of canola or wheat or maize, we're going to go in and we're going to completely destroy the existing vegetation. We call it plowing or tillage. Um, then we're going to plant this annual crop, single entity across that field, and then we're going to harvest that. Well, even when we do that over half of the biomass, the, the, the above ground biomass, over half of that's not human edible. So it's a resource that then even in that situation, we can use as a feed resource to uh, support animal agriculture and especially ruminant animal agriculture. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of it just gets wasted now, doesn't it? And they, when they take a crop, for example, like corn, the, the, the stem, everything around it, the skin, everything, nothing gets used. Well, it depends, right? So some of it is going to, in some systems, it may all be on the surface. The U.S. has um, a long history over a couple decades of people trying to figure out no-till or minimum tillage systems in which that material is going to be left on the surface. It's going to be broken down. Um, so it's not wasted per se, but even there, um, I just heard someone the other day say, if we were to take these um, crop byproducts and, and compost them, mm. the 
emissions from composting them is going to be five times what they would be if we fed them to a ruminant. Yeah. And if we put them in a landfill, then it's 50, five, zero times. So okay. a, a lot of our conversations have been oversimplified, right? The either, the or, the, the acting as if these emissions don't come from a variety of sources. We only focus. And so even, even when we talk about sustainable production systems, if we're really having a serious conversation, we need to look at societal factors as well as economic factors, as well as environmental factors. And too often, sustainability just devolves to merely looking at environmental and that, which can be dozens of things in that bucket, but that okay. too frequently gets minimize to only looking at emissions and it completely ignores a vast number of of other factors yeah yeah exactly um yeah I, I, exactly when people are well i suppose the the biggest argument that uh people have against ruminant animals is exactly that just the emissions and uh, I, I suppose the next biggest one would be the the land mass required to to graze cattle, uh, which is not as much as people um, argue argue with. It, they really don't take up as much land as say a lot of um, crops and things like that as well. Well, yeah, a couple ways to look at the land question. Uh, the primary one is that they are assuming that there's some other agricultural enterprise that could take be practiced on the land that the majority of the cattle are grazing, right? In other words, in, in the U.S. at least, rangeland is counted and permanent pasture is counted under agricultural land, okay? And so is the, the arable, the tillable cropland. Okay, so, you know, all, all, ag all arable land is agricultural land, but not all agricultural land is arable, right? So, you, you know, cr our actual cropland is a small portion of the earth's surface and a small percentage, relatively speaking, of our entire agricultural land. And so... If we were to try to till these, in, in some places they're called marginal lands, and I don't really like that, but that's the term. Um, w those lands are more sub subject to erosion and degradation, um, you know, and, and it would not be good stewardship to try. That's why we don't do it. Um, <laughs> that these are crop, these are rangelands for reasons besides, you know, the cattle industry wants to graze cattle there. I mean, that's ridiculous. The, 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 the rangelands exist and the cattle industry is supported by those rangelands. It's not that it's driven by the cattle industry. So that's one thing. Number two is, Frequently, people will try to compare the production from different systems. And so they will say, well, look, we can produce more calories from this hectare of crops than we can from grazing cattle on rangelands. So frequently, they're not comparing the yield of beef from the similar land class right there there but in any case and and so they they'll look at caloric yield they'll look at protein yield my point would be we're not talking about calories or protein with enough sophistication to say that a you know a hundred kilo a hundred kilocalories from plants doesn't have the same metabolic effect on human beings as a hundred kilocalories from animal source foods, right? I mean, it's it's sugar and starch versus fat, and so well, you not get every the, you get you also get into the argument that you know we don't 
actually you can't actually consume calories it's a unit of energy you know we, sure we develop on nutrients Sure. Uh, on the other true. hand, on the other yeah. hand, these are metrics that are used in the conversation. Yeah. So there's layers of these, and you're absolutely right. Calories don't weigh anything. Um, the the we we could get to the protein question, in which they want to compare, you know, so many kilograms of protein. I'm putting air quotes around it for listeners. Um, to from plant source foods to an equivalent amount of protein from animal source foods. They're not equivalent. Um, and this is a point that I've made in a couple, and, and it's not like this is new to me, yet it seems to not be well enough recognized within the food systems conversations, let alone the dietary guidelines conversations. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, a great point. You know, there's, everyone seems to think that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as it's protein. They don't understand that the the proteins and fats, for example, are full of nutrients. There's a reason that we consume these pro these particular proteins because they are far higher in uh, nutrient density than plant proteins. Um, so, yeah. can you tell us a little difference between some of the differences between the plant proteins and um, why they're not so consumable by for humans? Well, let's just start with that protein in quotes, because anytime you look in a table or on a label for a food and it lists a value of so many grams for protein, that protein is actually crude protein. Yeah. It's a term that we know from animal nutrition and it, it's it's an estimate that's based on the percent nitrogen that's in that feed or food. So we do that analysis. We come up with a nitrogen percentage. We multiply that by 6.25. And that gives us the crude protein value. It's based on the assumption that all of the nitrogen in that sample was in protein. And all of that protein was 16% nitrogen. So that's how we get that estimate. We've done it since the late 1800s. Um, it works okay with ruminant nutrition, sort of, um, because ruminant animals can utilize non-protein nitrogen. So for example, if I have green leafy vegetables, it's likely to have a significant amount of nitrate in it that nitrogen that's in the nitrate is going to be part of the estimate of the crude protein content yeah. when they do that analysis and publish those data. Okay, well, but that's not protein. And so people are kind of misled by the conversations. And then we don't, you, we don't digest protein. We absorb amino acids. Exactly. And maybe some, you know, short peptides, but basically these large chemical, these large molecules are denatured and broken down in our digestive system. And we absorb the components, the amino acids, animal source foods have all of the essential amino acids we require, and they have them in the proper ratios to each other. And so our ability to then utilize those amino acids that we absorb from the foods that we eat is limited by the essential amino acids that are present in the lowest amount relative to their requirement. So in other words, we don't have this, we don't have a uniform requirement for all these amino acids. We need more of some than others. But if one of those is, is, isn't present enough, then we can't utilize the rest of them. And so we'll use those for energy. We'll excrete the excess nitrogen. These are issues that are a big concern in poultry and swine. They've known about it for several decades. Um, not so much in human nutrition. Uh, which is really remarkable when, you know, we start to have these conversations. Um, um, of, of course, animal source foods 
are more than merely amino acids, right? They're, they're, they're the package of essential nutrition that human beings require for proper development and function. And, and, and I would say for flourishing. Um, yeah. So we, we've gone through this period over the last half century where we were taught to fear naturally occurring fat from animal source foods, particularly the saturated fat. We were even taught to fear the dietary cholesterol, yeah. which never had any justification. Um, and so then the industries go through this thing where they want to call themselves a protein industry rather than the meat industry. And they want to emphasize that they've got lean meats that can belong in hell, all that. I get it. I understand how we got, but, but now there's information <laughs> freely available that says that saturated fat in the diet doesn't cause heart disease. Dietary cholesterol should never have been a concern that, eating red meat does not is not associated with all cause mortality cancer or heart disease etc 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 so there's a whole long list of these zombie myths <laughs> that are yeah. still walking around and and we just have to keep killing them um yeah. and they come back and then influence the environmental conversations well, since we know it's bad for you, it's also bad for the planet, you know, so we'll bounce those ideas back and forth off each other. Um, uh, already talked about how the majority of the feed that's consumed by the global domesticated ruminant herd is not human edible. We're talking like 96%. In the US where we have significant feed lot operations, even there, a commercial steer, only 10% of its lifetime feed is going to be human edible, right? And if we assume all that was corn and we look at the human utilizable lysine in the corn versus the human edible lysine in the beef, that represents an increase of 240% in human edible lysine. And lysine is a globally limiting nutrient because the majority of humanity's protein supply comes from cereals and wheat is the largest source. And those are really poor sources of protein deficient in lysine. So yeah. all of these pieces start coming together. Beef is a net protein contributor in the to, to humanity's food supply. Yeah. As opposed to the conversations that we frequently are. Yeah. They were, <laughs> yeah, yeah, frequently bombarded with. Um, okay. So why exactly is uh, the wheat protein such a, a poor source of and can you give examples uh population wise the development differences in people um say uh a plant-based proteins to the uh, animal to the ruminant base well so plants are a very i mean that's why they're an entire different kingdom right <laughs> they're yeah. very different life forms from us and more closely related forms. Um, and so what they need is very different from what we need. Um, that um, one researcher told me that an eight-year-old boy physically could not eat enough rice and lentils to meet his lysine requirements if he had unlimited access. Wow. So, I mean, gut size and processing and not to mention the phytate and the, the fiber and all those and the carbohydrates that this poor, you know, and yet we, we, we live in a world where 95% of the world's vegetarians are economic vegetarians. They're not philosophical vegetarians. Yeah. Right. And, and so I want people to understand that malnutrition is a global issue across all income levels that when we look at all of the metabolic diseases, right? 
that that I, I, I listen to people like Professor Bickman or Professor Volick, and they have these quotes that say that virtually every chronic disease has some significant association, if not causal relationship to chronically elevated insulin, insulin resistance. Okay, that's right. well, that's malnutrition. Yeah. Right. And so, but we're not used to looking at those. You know, we even still have people talking about obesity as overnutrition. Yeah. Right. When, when we ought to that's, drill into that's this a, knowledge. Yeah, that's a good point. Many people don't understand that you could still eat quite a lot of food or so called calories. Um, and still be mal malnourished, even on a, well, yeah. a clean, uh, so well, a so-called clean diet. If you are, for example, low-fat diet, you're still malnourished. That was a overfed but undernourished is exactly. a phrase. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And maybe you know, so there are people who are suggesting that when we are eating these poor protein quality diets, primarily cereal based, we eat more in an attempt to get what we need. That's right. So maybe that's part of this as well as everything else that, you know, it's not a, a, a you know, simple thing. Um, there was, um, there's a meat scientist from North Dakota State University who makes that point that um, there's a reason that the swine nutritionists form rations out of soy and corn, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and yet we, and, and when, and he looked, I forget, I think he found 10 studies where they fed growing pigs lysine sufficient and deficient diets. And across those three things were consistent. One was smaller muscle loin eye, you know, back muscle size. So smaller muscle, um, greater subcutaneous fat and greater intramuscular fat deposition in the deficient group than in the sufficient group. And so the swine industry has been all about, um, you know, producing lean pork for the marketplace. So they were very interested in that as well as obviously they're selling muscle. And so if, if something is restricting muscle development, then that's something they want to avoid. Um, we we know that globally meat consumption a, a low level of meat consumption is strongly associated with stunting in children five years and under right so somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of children in that age group are stunted which isn't merely stature it's also brain development cognitive development and so these children are going to face a lifetime with that because if you miss critical stages of brain development, you can't make it up later. And so, so this is a global issue. And it, 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 the, the, the irony of where we are is we're seeing similar things in low and middle income countries and in high income countries, but in one place, it's a matter of choice primarily. I mean, I'm, I'm aware that within high income countries, you have people facing economic uh, challenges. I'm uh, uh, not denying that, but generally speaking, you have these issues of access and affordability in one part of the world and in other parts of the world where that isn't an issue, it's now driven by choice in the name of achieving some goals. And yeah. I, I think that there's sufficient evidence to suggest that those are poorly informed choices. And so yeah. we're seeing people being harmed through this uh, as a result of, of these um narratives and worldviews. Um, the World Health Organization says that the best source of the essential nutrients 
children six months to 36 months require for proper development come from meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood. You know, yeah. um, UNICEF says 60, 60% of children six months to 36 months do not get meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and there have been efforts at, at sort of community interventions where an egg a day makes a significant impact on a child's development. So I we're not talking about recently. a heavy lift. Hmm. Yeah, I think I saw, I saw that recently. I think it was in Indonesia. Um, they added, I mean, they, they basically they are economic uh, vegetarians, as you said before. Uh, a lot of these countries are. Um, but just simply by adding one egg a day to their diet, they in, dramatically increase the, the IQ and um, yeah, the function of s school children. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really aware cool. of Indonesia. I'm aware of work in Africa. There was some work done, and I think Colombia could well have been done. Um, so th there's clear evidence of human beings being harmed by too little animal source food in their diet. Yeah, and yeah. and and yet we have people who are still suggesting that there's such a thing as too much. And yeah. part of my mission is to say, okay, what, what do you think that is? What do you think that looks like from a health perspective? I mean, we can talk about the environmental thing separately, but we need to kind of separate these at this stage to get people to recognize that a lot of what we've been told in the nutrition and health space is based on the weakest quality evidence that we have, nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, a lot of—I mean, a lot of that goes back to the fact that um, these so-called bodies of or nutritional bodies, such as dietitians and things like that, are actually founded by people with an ideology behind them, um, mm -hmm. such as Kellogg's and the rest of them. Um, but as, as you were saying before. The, there's, a, there's a very big difference, 90% uh, or well, 95%, I think you said, of vegetarians in the world today are economic vegetarians. And this is actually touted by, uh, sorry, touted by um, a, a large number of like, people in the West who actually celebrate these numbers as a, a beneficial thing, as a great thing. Um, to try and further their own agenda. So how does that work in sustainability, not only in uh, health, but economically of a country? How does uh, this survive? Yeah, yeah well, you, you, you know, you, flourishing requires nourishing. Yeah. And if we're, if we're not providing the adequate essential nutrition. How about even optimal? But okay, let's settle for adequate. Right? Yeah. <laughs> if 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 that's not being provided, then we can expect to see all these other drags on economic development. Well, yeah. what are we seeing? We're seeing a global pandemic of chronic illness, right? And if the people that I respect that I've been listening to are right, a significant portion of that is due to malnutrition, as mentioned earlier. Mm. Well, okay, doing more of that, what's your, oh, you're going to build a bigger healthcare industry globally yeah. to ineffectively address that condition? I don't yeah. think that's a winning strategy. Just you know, I'm an agronomist. I'm not a, you know, big thinker e economist, but I, I, I think that that's probably, let's put it this way. Nobody in animal husbandry believes that the key to herd health is medication. They believe that herd health is based on proper nutrition. Yeah. Right. And, and if you if you get that right, OK, then it's a good thing that we have these medications that we can bring in to treat other things that happen. I mean, they're biological systems. Lots of things can go wrong. But 
it herd health begins with proper nutrition. And yet in, you know, we've, we've either ignored that or we've been distracted by, as you said just a moment ago, these worldviews and narratives about what constitutes proper nutrition. So we need to have, you know, kind of serious adult conversations about some of these things. I mean, I don't want to tell anybody what they should eat. On the other hand, I don't want people making decisions for themselves to say nothing about policy decisions that are yeah. based on these narratives and worldviews that, as you mentioned, frequently aren't disclosed even to the people within those communities, right? I'm, I'm sh you know, there, there's, there's one line that I try to keep in mind for myself. It goes something like, if an honest man is shown to be in error, he either ceases to be in error or he ceases to be honest. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to think of myself as an honest man. So I, you know, try to keep that not too far away. Um, on the other hand, so I'm, I'm convinced that the majority of people involved in this space are sincerely wrong, right? They believe what they've been told, what they've been taught, right? I get it. I, I know how you can get there. I'm also convinced that there's a number of people, hopefully small, but there's a number of them who know the truth and yet maintain the yeah. error. Yeah. Okay, so that's a completely that. different class, right? Yeah. That's that's something very different. And and once once you know, so part of what I do is I try to share the information, I share the resources, and then I see how people respond, and then yeah. I know how to respond. <laughs> so if, if we have people who have discovered that they have diabetes or, you know, high blood pressure, or you name the constellation of issues. And you say to them, well, there's a lifestyle intervention that these physicians over here are helping people implement, and they're achieving, you know, better markers without medication, you know, better quality of life. Yeah, much better health outcomes. Yeah, would you would you like to oh now you're gonna start talking to me about environmental issues? Okay, well let me suggest to you that maybe those aren't as you know, at, at some point these arguments become an excuse for not doing. Yeah. Right. So yeah, okay, exactly I, I I get it. I, I've been around the recovery community now for almost 32, 33 years. Um, so I get it, I understand. But at some point, it's on you because nobody's coming. <laughs> it's on each of us. Because if you're expecting the health ministry or, you know, the, 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 the medical industry groups to come and no, no, that's not the way this works. And it's, it's up to us. And we can, you know, we, we can get through this. We can help each other. But it's it, somebody, in fact, in Sydney last November, October, somebody said, don't, don't outsource your health. No. Yeah, right. great, great, great quote. Yeah. That, that's the thing. We've, we've been doing that too for uh, far too long now. Um, and we take no responsibility for our own health is another big part of it. We take no responsibility. We don't, it's too complicated. We don't want to know about it. Let's go to see the doctor. They'll they'll take care of us. Um, and and again, we can understand we can understand how you get there, but mm -hmm. we're we're not going to get to a better place if we stay there. And so, no, exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly where people are coming from. And I've been there myself. You know, it, we. I mean, I followed what I, I thought was the right advice. My my own education as well. I'm a strength coach, and you know. The low fat diets were the the way to be healthy, the way to be fit and lean, but um, you know it leads to many problems. Uh, and for myself, it led to blood cancer. So, that in the end, you have to take responsibility and and uh, you know try and take care of your own health yourself as as best that you can. Anyway, you, I'm not saying you can do everything yourself. Like 
and you know hospitals are good for many things such as you know if you have a broken arm or something you still need to go get that set yeah but, I'm, I'm i'm very grateful for the acute care right yeah we we do that well very grateful mm. it's the chronic mm. care that's a bit of a weak spot and i did just and thought of it uh, i thought of it recently and i was just rem the 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 russian doctor at the south pole that removed his own appendix oh wow he, yeah no <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm very grateful for the trained professionals, and I always want to act in a respectful manner um, for whoever I'm interacting with. Um, I, I think we have not been well served by people who found themselves in positions of at least perceived, if not in fact, authority. Mm -hmm. when it comes to this realm. And, and part of my mission is to introduce my agricultural tribe, right? The people that I was trained by and trained to serve with the metabolic health people that I've been fortunate enough to come in contact with. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that end to end, we have a really good story. So, you know, it, it, it does translate. I mean, um, I can I can pull the paper um, by the people that estimated the um, that the U.S. healthcare industry is a significant source of pollution, including yeah. 10, one zero percent of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. Now, it's not the same sort of estimates that the e the environmental protection agency puts out right so got to be careful with estimates the yeah. simplest thing is to say it's a number and it's significant and we're not looking at that right we, we the healthcare industry has gotten a pass in this conversation um yeah. and, and someone else another paper looked at the um emissions intensity of the global pharmaceutical industry. And they came up with a statement that said that the global pharmaceutical industry is a higher intensity emitter than the automotive industry. And there's greater variation across the industry. So from company to company, somebody else took those numbers and, and then looked at what the average adult American with type 2 diabetes spends on medications and came up with the estimate that if the average adult American with type 2 diabetes could eliminate their medication use, they'd reduce their carbon footprint 29%, 29% more than if they shifted from a high meat to a vegan diet. Wow. Okay. So what's the what is the environmental impact of the healthcare industry? We already know that it has a massive economic impact, <laughs> right? And what's the societal impact of the poor quality of care for chronic illness? Yeah. Right. What's the, what's the societal impact of people living diminished lives due to chronic illness or, you know, life years lost or what have you. And all of those can be quantified. And hopefully I can find some people to work on this project. So yes, once upon a time, somebody said there are no solutions. There's only trade-offs. <laughs> right? we're, we're, we're not good at evaluating the cost and the benefit. We only want to look at like our solution is all good, no bad. So of course we would recommend that everybody do that. But what would happen because we've already established that you can't swap pounds of protein from plant source and animal source one for one. Right. Yeah. And so if you're going to, and, and people have done the estimates of if we were to eliminate animal agriculture in the United States, we'd reduce anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions by something under two and a half percent. Yeah. And so globally, it would be 0.4 percent. It's not nothing, but it's close to it. But it comes yeah. at the cost, they said, of creating 
I would say exacerbating, but they wrote the paper, creating essential nutrient deficiencies and imbalancing our food system. Well, that doesn't sound like a good deal to me. No. Right. Um, and, and then you start looking around the world and you realize that over, you know, about half of the, you know, so about 4 billion people in the world are dependent on livestock manure for the food that they eat. Yeah. Um, half of, half of the world's farmers still use draft animals, mostly ruminants. Mm. You know, we have like a billion people in the world that are still burning dung to cook yeah. on, which yeah. has a whole number of problems with it. So this is the world that we, I'll talk about myself. I'm blessed that my ancestors came to North America, right? So I could be here. And, and I'm fully cognizant of all that. Too, yeah. People don't understand. Too. When, for example, people in the West, very few of them actually travel percentage-wise, but they don't understand that there are still countries, still people out there living without electricity, living without um, you know, modern farming techniques and, and things like that as well. And like you said, still burning dung. For, for heat and for cooking and things like that, that yeah. we, we just take for granted. And that is assumed that everyone lives the way they do and that that's, that's the biggest problem in the world. Like, yeah. they don't understand that economically there's, you know, there are, like you said, there are 95% of the world's uh, vegetarians are economic. And they're, not, they're not vegetarian by choice, but because they simply don't have access to ruminant animals um, as, as food-wise. Well, um, especially when they move out of the country into the cities, oh, yeah. right? I mean, at least if you're in the country, you have some access to food, right? Because of all of what's going on around you. I just watched a clip of somebody from Senegal, I believe she's from, but she describes, you know, when she grew up, if she wanted to take a shower, it was a 45-minute process. Wow. Yeah. If I want to take a shower, you know, shock my clothes and walk in the stall and turn on the water, right? Yeah. I, I just, so if we're talking about access to animal source foods and we're not at close to the point of production, now we're talking about the need for refrigeration, yeah. right? We're talking about foods that tend to be perishable, right? One of the advantages of all the processed plant source foods is they're shelf stable, right? Doesn't take a lot of preparation. You open the package, you eat them. Well, animal source foods tend to be different. So, okay, it's not merely, it, it's not the simple solution of, you know, going to my textbooks on my shelf and, you know, shipping them overseas and saying, good, we've sorted that problem. They now have the knowledge. Good. You know, there's <laughs> all these things. On the other hand, until people catch the vision of what I sum up by saying humanity's existential crisis is too little animal source food. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that we have malnourishment driving the healthcare burden globally we, we, we have this increasing loss of arable land due to degradation that in large part is due to cultivation, right? That they, the answer is not to break more ground. Our, our grasslands are our most endangered natural biomes. Yeah. And, and yet they get very little press. In fact, they're even being supplanted by people who, in the name of some goal, are going to come plant blocks of trees there, yeah. right, in, in an environment which is clearly not suited for trees, or they'd be there. Um, <laughs> That's true, yeah. I mean, they would yet. I mean yeah. Uh, so it, it's just there are days when I just scratch my head and say, you know, what what am I missing here? <laughs> but but there's it's 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 more than there, there's a huge group of people that I am you know interacting with of various disciplines, 
And what we have to do is build bridges, connect the dots. As one person said, we need to stop building silos and start building lighthouses. Yes. And, and I, I think part of the really good news is the health message. Because this yeah. is something that impacts virtually all of us, right? Everybody eats. The statistics are so bad that if it's not that person, it's in their family, right? I mean, and and so to to bring them that good news, whether they're within the primary industry communities or not, I think gives an opportunity for them to hear these other messages. But it sort of starts, you know, where they're most receptive, which, like I say, is is the health. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But health, that, I mean, this is so, actually, I, I spoke to an Australian senator about this uh, recently. Health is um, probably it's one of the, the largest expenses that any country has, especially in the Western world. And Australia is absolutely hemorrhaging money and... You know, it's one of the tools I believe that is used to keep a country in debt. Mm. Um, you you keep a, a population malnourished, and the the health and the health industry will flourish. I mean, it mm. it will grow and grow and grow, and it always just keep that country in debt. Um, because you just can't get on top of it. You can't get ahead mm. of it if if you if your population is malnourished. And that's the, I think that's the biggest problem. A lot of, and that's the biggest concern for most people is one, their health. Most people just want to be healthy. Um, two, longevity and being. Uh, and for me, it, it doesn't really matter how long you are here for, but you don't want to spend the last ten years of your life in bed, sort of thing. You know, you mm -hmm. want to be as healthy as you can or can be while you are here. Um, and people don't understand that. The, the best source or the, the most nutrient-dense foods that we, we need are ruminant animals. They tend to think that it's uh, we need more farmland uh, for, for mm -hmm. crops. Um, but then they get into the environmental issue, which is attached to it, you know. Right. Um, but what they don't see is that the ruminants actually give us our environment, you know. Yes. And there's so, they're so ignorant about environmentalism, like, uh, last last month, they cut down in um, in the UK, I think it is Ireland or Scotland. They cut down seventeen million trees to put up a wind farm. Right. <laughs> well, okay. and 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 so how how can you count burning wood as a renewable? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. that's green. And, yeah. and so so much of and. I don't want to get too far afield. There's some really wonderful sources of information that I've come to rely on when it comes to questions of, of energy. Um, one, one person described, he classifies the world into the high watt and low watt world. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that everyone, I think it's reasonable that, for the majority of people, they want to see their children better off than themselves. I think that's kind of a drive that's in all of us, whatever better looks like to them, right? I mean, that, um, and, and I think it's very clear that the data is all pointing, we're going in the wrong direction. So if not for yourself, for your children, um, and we, you know, don't ascribe, what is the, the, the quote is, so don't ascribe to, um, 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 what, what is it? So, you know, don't, don't blame a conspiracy for what ignorance, <laughs> you know, stupidity oh, yeah. produces. Yeah. And, and, and so, yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we're continually putting band-aids on things. And, and when that Band-Aid proves insufficient because it, you know, the cut needed sutures, then we just put another Band-Aid on top of it and, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Again, not to minimize what's available to us today. I'm well aware of the story of the introduction of penicillin and how remarkably short period uh, ago that was, um, yeah. you know, historically speaking. Um, 
So don't mean to take any of that for granted or minimize it. Um, on the other hand, we have gone in the wrong direction in a remarkably short period of time, which gives me hope that we can reverse it. You know, yeah. if, if yeah, I, the one figure that I've seen, I think this is right, says that the global spend for chronic disease care is going to hit $47 trillion in six years. Wow. Hmm. I mean, it's just, it, 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 these numbers it's are so big, mind. you know, what, what can't go on for, you know, what can't continue won't. There are hard rules of physics at play, you know, economics will out at the end. And so I, I, I think I'm seeing, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe optimistic. I'm not naive, right? Um, I think I'm seeing some signs of some of these narratives really face reality now because we've been told over and over, if you do this, you know, all these good things will happen and no negative things will happen. And yet now we're seeing the negative things and yet none of your positives have shown up. And yet, you know, we're seeing that, oh, you've got a real vested interest in this argument. It's not yeah. like you're some sort of, you know, knight coming here to enlighten the poor peasants. You're yeah. selling something, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, okay, I get it. That's marketing. That's politics. But now we know, <laughs> now we know which side of that honest man conversation you are. Right. Exactly. Um, so now we know how to act accordingly. And I think, again, when you improve your health, you are improving the world is one of my messages. And that gets us back to nobody's coming. It's it's on you. <laughs> you know, plural. That's on yeah. all of us. That's a great point. Um, yeah, and a, sorry, as I was just said, that's a really great point. It's... Um, you know, improving economics, uh, improving the country, improving the world um, is improving your health. You know, looking after your health and making sure you have the, the proper human diet. You are, especially like these, a lot of these these countries that are economic vegetarians, such as, as you said before, they would not be, they are pretty much third world countries um, suffering economic disaster, basically that would flourish if if they had the proper human diet that because their the whole country would improve well and there's many stages in there right i mean if you're a farmer or you're a rancher you're putting inputs into your the land that you're managing with the expectations that you'll be able to reap those right a, a return for that Right. Yeah. So there's rule of law issues, land ownership issues, you know, infrastructure issues, all of these. It's it's tremendously complicated, but it's not insurmountable. And, and if people catch this vision that, you know, what we need now is a ruminant revolution, like like we had a green revolution in the 60s and 70s. That was about calories. We had people that just weren't getting enough to eat period right and so when you read the the stories of the human experience of people going through famine okay if if you're starving you have one problem so yeah and 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 people do horrendous things in order to survive now we need a higher quality diet it's it's not merely caloric production anymore it's now the nutrition that is best provided by animal source foods and ruminant animal agriculture has these unique ecological advantages. So I'm not against, you know, pork or poultry. Mm. You know, I like bacon and a fried egg on my cheeseburger. I'm all for it. Um, hold the bun. Right. Um, <laughs> but and I, I get that some people are never going to eat beef and some people are never going to eat pork. And that's fine. Dr. Ballersted says, be sure to take your daily meds, which stands for meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. You pick whatever fits you, whatever is appropriate for you. But we must have animal source foods in our diet at some level. 
And people yeah, should me. feel free to figure out where that is for them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's something that we all have to. It doesn't matter how much information you get on your nutrition. You at the, at the end of the day, you have to experiment with what best suits you and uh, your body best reacts with. Uh, for me, I think that you have to have a good source, a good mix of animal fats. You can't have just survive on one specific source you know hence we've you know we've always eaten many different types of animals and including from the ocean we've always taken from the ocean as well so i think it's had good to have a mix mm. um and it, the local farmer i think um this is something people don't understand either the local farmer especially a ruminant animal farmer takes care of the, the health of the local um, town also takes care of the, the local economy. So buying local is really important for for economic reasons and health reasons and also environmental reasons because, as you said, these animals, they pretty much give us our environment. And, you know, um, this is something people don't quite understand. All around, whether it's environment, uh, um, you know, nutrition, health, um, and the the development of your um, community. Uh, as you said, like so many of these economic vegetarians are underdeveloped. These children and people are underdeveloped, not only physically, but cognitively as well. So they're really, the local ruminant farmer takes care of all of that for their community. Mm. Well, the new wealth generation um, ecosystem services, there's a list of things. Again, proper management is key, but properly managed grasslands are best for watershed management, uh, pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat. Um, how many people, you know, the, the number of people today that are involved in agriculture is somewhere around, you know, 2% at the farmer level in the U.S. Um, so as I was saying to one of my colleagues, just how many people driving look at the hills and, and look at that landscape when the animals aren't on those pastures and think, you know, what beautiful nature, yeah. <laughs> not understanding that that's the, that's part of this agricultural practice. Um, so, so again, there, there are these, conversations that are taking place that seem to me at least to lack some really essential facts in the conversation. And again, it, it's sort of like, you know, what's a healthy diet? Well, well, and, and it's come up a couple times, the mentioning nutrient dense. And I say, yes, but understand what their definition of nutrient dense is. Yeah. Because there are some people I'm looking at you, USDA, Health and Human Services, the producers of the dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. Their last edition was all about nutrient density, make every bite count. And so they, they showed the typical choice. This is a graphic picture. And so uh, at the bottom, they show the typical choice and then they show the more nutrient dense choice, right? So they don't, they, they don't think that naturally occurring animal fats are a nutrient. <laughs> so, so their assumption is meat must be lean in order for it to be nutrient dense. Yeah. So they show a couple things. One is they show butter, which I would want to know how many people are eating butter as opposed to margarine, but okay, that's their typical choice. Their more nutrient dense choice would be vegetable oil. Wow. Because saturated fat is not a nutrient. And then the one that just makes the point of how absurd this is, they so show soda as the typical choice, right? <laughs> and then sparkling water is the nutrient dense choice. Uh, now I like, I like sparkling water. That's a go-to right. beverage for me when I'm out and about, right? right. Nutrient dense. Yeah. I mean, you know, smack my forehead and go WTF. <laughs> exactly. But, but this, this is there. So 
that makes the point that when we're having these conversations, when we use words and other people are using the same word, we may not be meaning the same thing. No, exactly. Yeah. And, and so and we you just said need before, to be sure about that. That whole, pro, that whole macronutrient thing too is people don't understand. We, we absorb the amino acids. Um, not It's not actually the, the protein as a whole. Um, and as you said, so we, we all look at these nutrients as a, uh, in a different way. Um, and the same, you know, the ADA, for example, um, I was talking to Dr. Robert Lufkin a little while ago, um, the, the ADA, he has actually spoken with them, uh, well, for them many times. But they're actually, you go to their conventions, they're actually sponsored by Coca-Cola and all these other food industry, right. you know, manu manufactured food industries. So um, you know where their loyalties lie. You know, they're, they're not going to speak against the people that are giving them money. Well, and it, it, you know, one of the, one of the things I'm fortunate is I don't need to do this for money. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not, I don't take speaker fees. I don't, not looking to endorse anything. I won't, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to publish regularly and I don't take money for, you know, that, um, you know, so it, it it's a remarkable human being that can, you know, just like not be affected by that um, when it's when it's part of the system. So if it's just not part of the system, I don't have to worry about it. Um, the the we we have, and, and I think we need to be <laughs> aware that if if it's if it's something I don't approve of, then it's a vested interest. If it's something I approve of, then it's in the public interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just because you know human beings are kind of funny that way um yeah. so i i think that we we've covered a number of things that all point to um toward the same thing that that proper nutrition is essential for proper human development function and health span i i like that phrase versus lifespan right um and and that Anything we do is going to have an environmental impact. It's going to come out somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even to the point where human beings who are primarily fat burners, as opposed to carbohydrate burners, emit less CO2. So yeah. somewhere in this system, it's going to come out because it's all based on this cycling of CO2 via photosynthesis. Right. And, and whatever the cow or other ruminant burps out is going to be oxidized from methane to CO2 in about 10 years. So it's a, it's a cycling as opposed to other systems that require the input of fossil fuels, which represents an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's many conversations that I've just had to learn how to pull them apart and say, let's talk about this bit. Because if we get too high up, then, you know, it's sort of like I train myself to say therapeutic carbohydrate reduction <laughs> because that makes specific points. It, it does. It's demonstrated to have therapeutic effect and really who's against reducing carbohydrate intake. Well, there's a few, but, but <laughs> most people recognize that eating too much sugar or processed starch isn't good for us. So no, right. how, how, how much of this can we achieve before we hit the points where we're now going to start arguing? And maybe yeah. we can make some progress by finding those points of common uh, agreement. If you were going to terraform, say, uh, arid land, how would you do it? Terraform. Well... I guess I would want to make sure that I know where I'm starting from in terms of what its capacity is, mm. right? Maybe I can only graze that land every other year. Yeah, That's fine. So will the system available allow that, right? And you can think of all the problems. Um, there's, there's so many, there's so many points to that. Um, 
I'm a very nervous about the people who are talking about how they're going to geoengineer our way out of whatever perceived problem they think we're in. Yeah. Like I'm very, I'm very suspicious of the people who want to come up with some faux food that they think is going to be the solution to whatever problem. There's an arrogance um, and, and a lack of humility at work here. So rather than at least what I perceive from that word, and it may be entirely on me and my perception, I would want to look more at what can that land sustainably provide for human benefit. You know, at the end of the day, I'm for team human. And so, you know, if, if we can accomplish that in a way that's environmentally sustainable, that's economically sustainable, wonderful. Let's, let's, let's find that because I think that we've reached a certain point in our development as a species that we don't have to provide for all our needs in one small place there are ways for us to bring in from other parts of our region, our country. Okay. Um, so the need for subsistence agriculture, for example, at least in our country currently is not as high as it is in other parts of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of these, we need to learn that not, every part of the world is equally suited to various practices. And, and we need to get comfortable with saying, okay, we're going to do this here. And I don't mean to imply that this is top down management. It's just sort of a philosophy. Um, and, and I think that that's sorting itself out in many parts of the world. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I agree that these, um, so-called uh, plant, or well, so-called plant-based foods, such as uh, plant-based meats. The, the the plant that we the, we're talking about is actually a, a factory, like a <laughs> chemical plant sort of thing. Um, but there is a definite lack of humility, and uh, to, to, I think as a species, we are we are we tend to think that we can create our own foods. We're like intelligent enough to think mm. that we can make something for ourselves but stupid enough to eat it unfortunately <laughs> it's it's um, yes we yes. cannot I mean, make let's anything. let's ignore those hundreds of thousands of years of evolution yeah. and yeah. and the pressure that it exerted somebody the mm -hmm. uh, presentism like yeah. we're smarter than people were a thousand years ago yeah. or whatever the number is and and so that's just I, I, I think that has to be beaten out of us at some point, unfortunately. So, um, well, that we're smarter than nature, you know. Um, well, nature votes last, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, so uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I just one last point. I just want to say that you know people evolved because they ate meat. Not be, not we didn't evolve to eat meat. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, I guess that's a point that's been made. I guess um, Jessica Thompson from Arizona, well, she was at Arizona State University, I believe. Now she's at Yale doing some work. She and um, one of her papers is the human predatory pattern, you know, the distinguishing characteristics of modern human beings is that we're the only existing primate that routinely kills and consumes animals larger than ourselves and has throughout our existence. I mean, basically. Um, that, that what the inflection point for us as a, or even preceding Homo, um, was um, the utilization of marrow and brain as a scavenger from these kills that the, the, the carnivores couldn't access in long bones or skull cases. And so, you know, you have these clever little hominids that come along with a hammer stone 
and yeah. and harvest that then in that sense uh, and then that led to you know the expense you know from ILO and expensive gut hypothesis okay now we're eating a richer diet we don't need the bigger gut we can support a bigger brain we're eating the building blocks of a bigger brain that leads to things you know at, at, at some point then we learn about cutting instruments and we start that so all of that I absolutely uh, um, agree with part of what animates me is saying you know no mammal is designed to digest a low to digest a low-fat diet yeah exactly you know even even a ruminant ends up digesting a high-fat diet but that happens because of the rumen microorganisms that take the fiber and make short chain fatty acids out of it and okay. then the animal absorbs those volatile fatty acids and so we don't have a rumen <laughs> we yeah. don't you know have the large large intestine or cecum that some primates do like a gorilla yeah. and we also don't eat our own droppings mostly um and but so we can't you we, we don't have those um nutritional physiological um tools and adaptations okay. that allow us to use that low fat diet we have to consume this high fat high protein high protein quality diet mm -hmm. to get the nutrients so we can't make the organic materials out of inorganic we have to yeah. consume other organisms yeah and okay. and then we get into the whole question of well these organisms are okay to consume and these aren't no, no, no. Yeah. human beings have eaten anything that hasn't eaten them already right so <laughs> exactly yeah that's just the way it's been so anyway um that the better that thank you very very much for all your time You've been very generous with me thank you um i i will put all the links to all your work um in the description and um where you, where we can find you on social medias as well wonderful wonderful work that you are doing and um i hope you have a good trip next year to australia and uh, educate some people on you know what's got really going on and what we really need um, yeah, hopefully I would love to get down there and see it actually. So thanks again for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure. Absolutely.